Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is Bloomberg Business Week with Carol Masser and Tim Stenebeck on Bloomberg Radio. I want to get to our next story. Uh, this was interesting. You know, we um, have written about this at Bloomberg. When Adobe released its Firefly image generating software last year, the company said the AI model was trained mainly on Adobe stock, its database of hundreds of millions of licensed images. Firefly, Adobe said, was a commercially safe alternative to competitors such as Midjourney, which learned by scraping pictures from across the internet. Behind the scenes, Adobe also was relying in part on AI-generated content to train Firefly, including from those same AI rivals. In numerous presentations and public posts about how Firefly is safer than the competition due to its training data, Adobe never made clear that its model actually used images from some of these same competitors. This latest reporting from our own Rachel Metz and Brody Ford just last week about how Adobe promotes its tool as safe from content scraped from the internet. We've got with us Ashley Still, Senior Vice President and General Manager of Creative Business at Adobe. She's back with us. She joins us from Menlo Park, California. Ashley, good to have you with us. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks so much for uh, coming back with us. I I do want to start here, given our colleagues' recent reporting. Uh, We should note Adobe did say that a relatively small amount, about 5% of the images used to train its AI tool was generated by other AI platforms. Can you add anything here, given what you work on at the company? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you know, we continue to, you know, we we stand by and have, have stood by Firefly as... Um, commercially safe, as as you mentioned, since we launched. Um, and what this means is we are incredibly confident and have, uh, you know, some very significant measures in place to make sure that the content generated by Firefly uh, doesn't infringe on copyright, IP, trademarks, you know, you name it. And um, and you know, as 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 uh, example of how we stand by that, we actually offer indemnification um, for the content that is that is generated by Firefly to businesses. So, in terms of, go ahead, Tim. Well, I was just going to say. So, if, if why wasn't the company or hasn't the company been clear about the fact, at least from the beginning, that Firefly was trained on some generative AI from the same same kind of companies that Adobe has publicly tried to distance itself from? Yeah, you know, I I think we um uh it we have always been clear that there is some AI generated content that's used in training um and uh and you know, in fact, I think as as editing that that is AI assisted becomes more common, it's going to be harder and harder to to say that there's any image doesn't have some AI generated aspects of that image, right? And mm-hmm. and I think in the past I've uh, we've talked about some of the capabilities that we've released in Photoshop. So we've always been clear about that. Um, you know, we actually don't necessarily have a lot of information about the source of the the AI that's generated, and that's why we focus so much on um, making sure that again the content. Uh, that anything that's submitted to Adobe stock doesn't have any owned aspects of that, uh, of of anything in that image, right? Again, no copyright, trademark, um, uh, identifiable characteristics um, as part of that image. Um, so we've been pretty consistent about that. I think what's happened recently is some very specific questions about, well, could there be images generated um, from specific sources? And and of course, there could be. There could be. I am curious, or we are curious, you know, if you've got any calls from customers maybe about the possible confusion here about, you know, are we really 100% commercially safe or is it more like 95% commercially safe? Yeah. What our customers want to know is, are we indemnifying them, mm-hmm. right? And, and right. the answer is, a hundred percent yes, <laughs> right. Nothing's changed, and um, and nothing's changed about our confidence in in that uh, Firefly will not produce content that ha- that infringes on other people's owned um, marks, content, etc. Right, and then we do that again by being really careful about the content that we train on. As I mentioned, mm-hmm. everything goes to regardless of the source, whether it's 
generated by a camera or or sketched with a human hand or um, you know assisted or created through artificial intelligence every piece of content goes through a moderation process through our Adobe stock marketplace before it ever is used to train anything and and so we really do that regardless of the source of the content and that's a huge part of it the other aspect is the types of things and prompts that we actually allow you to create. Mm -hmm. And so again, the, nothing's changed in terms of um, of the process and the technology that we have in place to give us this confidence around commercial safety. I do wonder too, um, does it give you, a Ashley, by really training mainly on Adobe stock, which I can imagine is massive and growing every day or every second. Mm -hmm. Having said that, right, we know that generative AI um, is going to be made better by more and more information that is put into it, more and more data. So do you limit kind of to some set, to some, in some regard, the upside of the potential uh, of all of this by keeping it, I understand by keeping it commercially safe, very important for clients, but is there some limitations as a result of that in terms of, I don't know, creativity or or, or ability yeah. because you're well, not a, opening it to everything? Well, that's a great question and actually um, uh, very relevant to some another piece of news that we announced today. So we actually announced two things today. First, we are showcasing um, video AI workflows that we'll be bringing into Premiere Pro later this year, which is incredibly exciting. And then we also uh, 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 kind of snuck or showed some early explorations around uh, things that we're exploring with third parties around bringing third party models uh, into our applications. And, and in this case, it was specifically uh, partners in the video space or potential partners with, in the video space with a open AI Sora with Runway and, um, and a smaller company called Pika. And uh, to your point, models are going to be good at different things, right? Mm. And whether it's the training approach or whether it is, uh, you know, just the decisions made about, about what the model is for and the use case that it's solving. Um, in the case of Firefly, one of the things that we've really prioritized is creative control and controllability because we deeply integrate Firefly into our creative applications like Photoshop and in the case of video, um, certainly Premiere Pro, because our customers want to edit content with mm -hmm. AI. They want to take their original images you know, and video and um, and produce the content that they're that they want to produce faster and with more creative expression um, than ever before. Uh, but in in some cases, there might be uh, use cases that models are good or are, are, are well, great at Ashley, uh, that isn't a focus for us. I want to jump in because we only have thirty seconds left, and I'm I'm so curious oh, sure. about this. How do you how do you prevent um, deep fakes and and stuff from um, from this generative AI video? Sure. So that is going to be a huge area of focus, and content credentials is absolutely critical. You can think of that as a nutrition label for content. There's a open standard that Adobe started with many partners. I think there's over 2,000 um, uh, companies that are now part of this uh, part of this open uh, uh, standard, and and we think that it's incredibly important for any editing tool or mm -hmm. generative tool to just be to put metadata in the content and then enable consumers to quickly and easily see how right. the content that they're consuming every day was created. Always great to check in with you and find out what you guys are up to uh, with all of this. Ashley Still over at Adobe. We always like to re remind everyone that our next guest is the inventor of the Segway. You know it, of course, the human transporter that balances itself. He also holds, Carol, a variety of patents. A variety. It's a like variety. A, we've all lost count. So many. Um, I don't want to say what? millions, but it's there's a lot. lot. Yeah. His focus now? 
expanding the reach of first robotics competitions in the minds of young people. Yeah, I've been lucky to go to one of the events, the competitions, uh, many years ago in St. Louis. It's so cool. Dean Kamen is the founder of FIRST, which stands for For Inspiration and Recognition of Science and Technology. He joins us from Manchester, New Hampshire. Dean, so great to have you back with us. Actually, Wes, we were preparing for this segment. One of our producers, our YouTube producer, Elizabeth Cedron, she actually was competing in the FIRST Robotics competition in St. Louis, which I was covering for Bloomberg TV at the time. But the world's crossing, you didn't even know it. <laughs> but she talked about what a great experience it was um, to be part of it. So great to have you back with us. And yeah, it feels like all of our worlds are colliding right here. Um, how are you? And, and tell us about uh, the latest round of FIRST and what you guys are up to. So things are great here in my day job. I have about a thousand engineers. We're working on all sorts of neat projects. We just got the FDA approval on a really small, wearable, high-performance insulin pump for people with mm. diabetes. We are working on all sorts of other projects at Army, our Advanced Regenerative Manufacturing Institute, which has now got 200 members, and we're manufacturing cells, tissues, and organs, hopefully some of which will be through the FDA relatively soon in FDA uh, uh, promises. Wow. Um, we're doing all sorts of neat stuff, but every one of our projects and every member of Army is suffering from the same issue. Talent, talent, and mm. talent. And uh, the good news is it's now become common knowledge to our government leaders, our industry leaders, our education leaders, that the most critical shortage this country has is really passionate, talented uh, STEM folks. And as you know, 35 years ago when I started first, I was telling people that until we can make science, technology, engineering, and mathematics as exciting to kids, as accessible to kids, as rewarding to kids, as football and basketball and the world of entertainment, this country will continue um, to celebrate you know, those things, sports and entertainment, and create the world's best people in sports and entertainment. But that's not going to keep this country going. We need to get kids, particularly women and minorities, that culturally have been literally pushed away from thinking about careers in science and technology. So as you know, the, the power to me of sports to engage kids and get them passionate seemed to be all we had to do, yeah. create create a science engineering competition that mm -hmm. could that could compete for the hearts and minds of these kids. And we went from 23 teams 35 years ago. This year, we have over 80,000 schools worldwide. Wow. We have 100 Amazing. countries involved. The championship, which starts on Wednesday and goes to Saturday, will this year be in Houston, no longer in St. Louis. But we'll have over 50,000 people from representing all the teams from around the country and around the world competing there. Over a thousand teams will be there. Right. You should be there. It's going to be well, fantastic. You and we are, we are showing, for those who are watching uh, on YouTube and Bloomberg Originals, um, some of the past competitions. And if you are not familiar and you have kids, you should just Google it and check it out because it really is about kids building and making things and then competing and love it. It's really, really cool. Dean, I'm wondering, obviously FIRST has grown so much in the last 35 years, but I'm, but I'm wondering if how this is viewed by uh, local governments, how it's viewed by school boards, how STEM is viewed in the classroom as part of a, a child's education here in the U.S. I'm wondering if that's gotten any better over the last 35 well, years. Well, I'd like to, I'd say FIRST is taking credit for making it a lot better. Our governor, uh, Chris Sununu announced earlier this year that we're going to put a first kit and a first robotics uh, program, not in every school in the state, but in every classroom in the state, because our new little robotics kits don't cost a whole lot more than a single textbook. That's cool. And by the way, last Thursday evening, we had a huge event in Washington, D.C., and our Secretary of Commerce, Gina Raimondo, was there pointing out that it is so critical to get STEM uh, cool. you know, up and in the hearts and minds of kids around the country. And as you know, the, the, the CHIP Act is gonna put out more than $50 billion, but it's not gonna help, as she pointed out, unless we have the people with the skill sets to fill these factories, to make these chips, to write the code, to do the AI, to use the AI. So the answer to your question is, I think STEM is finally, and I'd like to think FIRST has something to do with it, 
uh, really becoming front and center to serious people that are looking to the long-term future of this country's needs. And we got to get back to getting all kids from all backgrounds more excited about STEM. And as I said, we have a sport that's as exciting as every other sport, but the only difference between first and every other sport is in our sport, every kid on every team can turn pro. And that's why your business community Mm -hmm. ought to be demanding that they have first teams in every school. I think it's really interesting. You know, there's a couple of things. I would agree with that. And it's like we talk a lot about just financial know-how. In other words, you know, planning for your retirement savings. I agree. It's another thing that kids should be taught pretty early. Having said that, you talked about AI and that you your thinking is, listen, we're going to need more engineers more than ever before because of it. Go there a little bit more deeply because I do wonder about your perspective. Someone who makes things, has made lots of things um, and thinks about technology and the things that are innovate, innovating or disrupting kind of how we do things. Um, when you look at AI, generative AI, machine learning, what will be mandatory? Because you know some of the discussions that are going on, Dean, right now is that it's going to replace a lot of technical jobs. How do you see it? Someone who's been in this world making and understanding technology on a level that many don't. Well, I, I'm no historian, but I think pessimists that are always afraid of innovation, always afraid of change, always look at the worst possible outcomes. I am sure that hundreds of years ago, when the first steam engines came along, uh, people predicted that there'd be no more work for labor, for backbreaking ditch diggers, uh, because a steam engine could do the work of 10,000 of them. But what they didn't realize is once you've got bulldozers, you're not going to build tiny holes with a small number of people. You're going to build super highways that cross continents. Once we develop a new technology, yes, it'll replace some people that were doing some of it in the past. But if the new technology is more empowering and more efficient, all that it does is open up huge expanses in new human growth and opportunity. And so I can't think of a single new technology that while it always displaces let's say, uh, some piece of the current world, it always expands more and better opportunities. And I can't imagine that that the, the people that might be displaced from doing boring, repetitive jobs that can have robotic systems take their place, not just physically, but even in terms of the technology that, that is behind AI will give engineers more powerful tools. It'll give more people more capability to focus on solving even bigger, by today's standards, insurmountable problems, understanding genomics and figuring out how to make better uh, drugs, figuring out how to do all sorts of things that Mm -hmm. the current technologies just make too expensive or too risky. So I think anybody worried about uh, uh, the advances and the career opportunities that will be created by AI isn't a very good student of history. New technologies will enable us to build a better world. They will create more new, exciting, not just jobs, but whole uh, industries that we don't even think about today. And I think that's a recurring theme, but it does require that people be prepared for better and faster education about Mm -hmm. these new things. Mm -hmm. And I think we need kids to grow up learning that they've got to remain learners their whole life because Hmm. technology is moving so quickly. By the time they leave college, half of what they learned in college is now obsolete. They need to learn how to use technology as a tool and keep learning. Um, 30 seconds. So the next uh, first robotics uh, competition, April 17th, 20th in Houston, right? Real quickly. 17th to the 20th in Houston. Please be there. You, You guys should cover it. It's going to be a celebration that will be the cross between the Super Bowl and a rock concert. It's fun. It's important. Uh, We have 3,700 corporate sponsors there. Qualcomm, again, is a seasoned sponsor. Uh, You should be there. Well, and as I said, I remember when I went, Will I Am was there, and the, your board was always really impressive, uh, really a cross section of leaders in the tech sector, because they are watching very closely because uh, kids today are their future workforce, no doubt about it. Dean Kamen, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Founder of First, as we said, uh, joining us from Manchester, New Hampshire on this Monday.